Welcome to yet another episode of the More Than A Game podcast and today's guest I'm pretty excited by because I grew up watching this man play and he's one of my all-time favourite players. He's a four-time Olympian, played 15 seasons in the NBL, playing 440 games. That stints in Europe and, and in the NBA, playing for the Minnesota Timberwolves and the San Antonio Spurs. He captained the Sydney Kings to their first ever championship in 2003. And after retiring from the sport, he's had a successful career in coaching, uh, coaching the Sydney Kings. He's now suiting up for his first season in charge of the Sydney University Flames in the WNBL. He had the nickname Hammer because of his incredible shooting style and his accurate three-point shooting style. And it's a pleasure to welcome again one of my favorite players of all time, Shane Hammerheel. Shane, Shane Hill, welcome to the More Than A Game podcast. Great to be here, mate. Appreciate the intro. Nice. Oh, that's all good, mate. Again, a bio as long as my arm. It's an uh, incredible career that you've had, and we'll dive into it today. I'm excited by um, your availability today and coming on the podcast. But before we begin, I just want to jump into, obviously, Saturday night and the Australian Boomers winning their first ever medal at an Olympic Games. It was an incredible achievement. As someone who was a part of two bronze medal matches in the past and shared the disappointments of those games with uh, many of your former teammates, um, how, what were the satisfaction levels like after watching them win that bronze medal? I was incredible, really, and it was really a relief and, and just happy for the guys. And um, you know, It's been a long time coming, a lot of heartbreak, as you said, four times we finished fourth and uh, you know, to have Gorge come in and he did such a great job coaching this team and uh, and to have those guys that are committed for so long, that core group of, of Paddy and Joey and Dally and, and Baines, um, and you throw Bogut into that mix mm. too recently, retired, but um, just happy for them because they've sacrificed so much and it's so different when you play in the NBA and you're playing so many games in a year. It's easy for people to say, no, nah, I'm not do it this year or they pick and choose and, and whatever. Um, those guys simply haven't done it. They deserved it, and uh, and they got it. And I couldn't have been more proud. Mm. That was an incredible achievement. I even shed a tear myself. And uh, I guess from your point of view, all those players that came together. I read an article today. Um, they were talking about the states and how the United States, obviously, and what a powerhouse they are. But something that we have on them is that desire to play for the Boomers, sing a little, to represent your country, and. As you said, there's a core group that's been in place for quite a number of years now, but the USA will probably never have that because players come in and out and they just can't build that sort of culture, I guess, around, um, yeah, they obviously love playing for their country, but the boomers have always, always had that unique culture of, yeah, just playing for one another. And um, So where do you see us moving in the next few years based on this, uh, I guess, setting the standard now of a bronze medal? Um, what is the limit now for the boomers? Well, I think that America, going back, back to your point, America, it's almost like on players' bucket list. Like, yep, I want to go to the Olympics at some stage, but how many Olympics are they going to commit to? And again, I go back to the fact that these guys put in so much time in the NBA oh. that by the time the season finishes, you want, to get, you want to put your feet up. You want to go get some sun. You want to spend time with family and friends and do things that you wouldn't normally do because you know how intense it is in the NBA season. Oh. And that's what makes it even more incredible for our group of guys that have been able to do that you know the worrying thing moving forward is that you know for, for me growing up and for drewy and Vlahov and Raggy, that's all we ever wanted to do we weren't yeah. dreaming of hey because no one had ever done it before so it was all about putting on the green and gold now these guys um you know ha have been able to make it and have a big influence in the nba and they've been able to balance that with the boomers um, the challenge moving forward will be able to keep those guys as committed to wanting to do it every single World Cup, every single everything else. It's more of a challenge. It's good that guys like Giddy and um, Josh Green um, that sort of grown up here that will probably commit. Um, but it is a challenge. It's a balancing act. And um, the culture of the boomers has always been strong from the people that sort of handed it over to guys like the group that I just said, the older guys, and then we've been able to hold, hang it on to the next guys and it, and it continues to grow of what it means so um just so happy they've been able to get it done and and you're right i mean the standard for australian basketball for a long time has been top four mm. and it's a fine line between success and failure it's so bittersweet to make it to the top four i used to go to greece and, and played in greece for three years 
And people would be blown away and say, mate, how, well, they wouldn't say mate, they'd say, <laughs> how is, is Australia yeah. in the top four? How the hell are you guys in the top four? After 2000, we made the top four and they sacked Barry Barnes. I mean, the rest of the world couldn't believe that we'd overachieved. Mm. So we've had that standard there for a long, long time. Now they've, they've got that medal. We have to keep it in perspective as well. It's mm. still unbelievably tough to be able to get there and be able to succeed. Mm. Absolutely, and you can see that throughout that uh, campaign, how tough it was. But um, you mentioned the culture and passing at the end. I've just got a quote here from Paddy Mills that he was interviewed after the game, and um, I just want to read this quote out to you because, again, it sort of epitomises what you said about the boomers' culture being handed down. And he says, I think we have been able to build our culture in understanding the lay of the land that goes far beyond basketball. For us, it's always been about giving back and where we have been able to build our boomers' culture is to the point, to this point, is understanding where we come from. Our name is the boomers for a reason. And for us to give back to our nickname, it is where we started this campaign. campaign. So some incredible words there from Patty, and obviously an insp- inspirational leader. But when you think about all those players that have worn the green and gold, he's right that it's been passed down from generation to generation. But what is it about the boomers' culture that's uh, built that or or develop that and um, for you personally who wore the green and gold on so many occasions what was it like for you to wear that that jersey and to represent your country well I, I think the biggest thing we have is we just have so much pride in representing our country and so much passion to be able to do it I mean I grew up playing footy and had to make a choice of you know which way I was going to go but it was always the overriding factor for me is trying to go to the Olympic Games and, and playing for the Boomers, representing our country. You know, I told my dad when I was 12 that I was going to go to the Olympics. And back then, it's probably more of a dream than it is a goal. But we both believed that I was going to be able to do it. And I was single-minded about trying to make that happen. And I was lucky enough to be able to achieve it. But you go through some tough times as well. I mean, my first one, 1990, I got cut. I felt like I should have been in the team. I was averaging 20-something points in the NBL as, you know, 20, as a 19-year-old. And you don't, you don't always get what you sort of deserve and what you should get. And sometimes it's hard, but you have to be able to, you know, commit to it and brush yourself off and get back and work on your game to be able to do it because, you know, nothing comes easy. And, um, but everyone's in the same boat. You have to sacrifice when you're playing for the boomers. You have to adjust your role. You know, you're not always going to play the same sort of minutes. Um, but it's always team first. There's always no dickhead policy <laughs> with the players and, you know, you just enjoy each other's company and, and I feel like we overachieve, you know, with our nation and the talent we've got to some of these other countries and um, because of all of those things. Mm. Final question on the Boomers before we launch into your career, which I'm keen to ask you some questions about. Just on Paddy Mills, obviously that 42-point game was incredible and no doubt solidify himself as one of Australia's best ever players. Can we say that he is the best of all time? Which is a controversial statement, I know. But also, you mentioned Brian Gorge in there. Like, to get that group together in the time that he did, um, to perform they did, he prepared them immensely and immensely well. But also having so many new guys coming to the, the team as well. Um, does that performance just make him or solidify him as the greatest coach Australia has ever seen? Well, I think Gorge's record and the NBL sort of already did that. I think now he's come on and been able to, you know, take this Boomers team to another level um, without doubt does that. Uh, he's incredible, particularly the defensive end. I mean, he's just such a great defensive coach. Mm. Uh, good at the offensive end too, but more than anything else, he, he's just a great leader of men. Mm. He gets everybody on the same page. You believe every word that he says. He sells it. You could play against the worst team at the Olympics and he would have you believe that that team's like a dream team. <laughs> you know, you're done. It's wow. just the way you, he is. Um, you know, back to, you know, Paddy. I, I, I hate comparing sort of um, eras. I think um, what Paddy's done, 42 points, his leadership, his commitment over so many years, the standard he set, um, you know, the leader he is of, you know, Australians, but also in the indigenous indigenous community as well. I think as a role model, I think he's just unbelievable. Um, and, and he's definitely in the conversation. But what Drewy's done, 
you know, is equally as good. And uh, sometimes time, you know, allows us to forget those things. So comparing the greats is always something I'm pretty uncomfortable in doing. Yeah, fair enough, mate. You're up there in the conversation, in my opinion, too, as a boomer. But um, let's move into your career now because I first met you, you probably don't remember this, but it was uh, 2002, I think it was, so the Menai Dragons uh, basketball presentation, the team I played for in Sydney's uh, South. And I was a 14-year-old. I made the decision that I want to be pro. And I remember going to see you play the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games and Andrew Gaze. And I watched that game as a 12-year-old. I was like, that's what I want to do. And that was my dream. Didn't quite make it. But that's okay. Um, but at that uh, presentation, I remember, I think it was my dad actually asked the question that his son wants to be a professional basketballer. What are some of the qualities or what do you need to put in place to be able to make it at that level? And I remember your answer was it built around determination, hard work, but put in the effort in. And in particular, you mentioned around getting a few hundred shots up in a day. And um, I was blown away by that in terms of the level of you know, work required to get to that level. Was that something that you yourself were naturally sort of born with? Did you always have that desire? And I guess going back a bit further, what drove you to be the best basketball player that you could be? I, I think um, passion is the key. Mm. If you've got the passion um, to be able to make things happen, if you actually love it, then mm. it doesn't feel like work. And, you know, I would shoot four, five, six hundred shots in a day as a kid. I used to... You know, shoot before school, I'd shoot after school, I'd shoot all weekend. Mm. You know, I'd play that many games a week, but I'd just come home and work out and I'd get my brother to play against me. He'd get tired, he'd go in and then I'd get my mum to come out and I outgrew my mum, so I'd get her to play defence with a broom. <laughs> and then I just, I'm like, no, I'm not leaving until I make this many shots going left. I'm not leaving until I make this many shots from here. Mm. And then I'd just keep setting challenges for myself. I trained in ankle weights. You know, I'd box, I would um, have the skipping rope out and I was just so focused on being able to go to the next level and I loved it. I didn't feel like it was just some crazy work ethic, but I knew it was and it gave me confidence to be able to make shots that growing up, you know, most people thought were probably outlandish that, you know, where we were shooting it from and pulling up from the three-point line. You've got to remember in the 90s, I took over from Phil Smythe, mm. you know, conservative, point guard that you know growing up that's what you were meant to do as a point guard you dribble the ball down you organize everybody you get them into your sets and you allow other people to do it and I felt like I could do that but I also felt like I could score at the same time and it was almost like that transition period and, and I think Drew and I were sort of shooting threes like it, it is today is mm. that's how mm. you're expected to pull up on the break now yeah. You know, you never knock back a three-point shot. The point guards are expected to create and score and get assists as well and be aggressive. So I feel like we're a little bit ahead of our time and it came from building the confidence of doing that in the day-to-day and, and, um, and then being able to transition to that into the games. Mm, absolutely. And you had one of the, as I said at the outset, the most incredible shots I've seen. Like, it wasn't conventional by any means, but you're just incredible. And I think for me, growing up watching you, the thing I loved about you was that you were able to create your own shot that's something I tried to do a fair lot. So for those um, younger players out there that may be listening, um, how important is it to not just get shots up but work on shot selection and trying to you know, create your own shot, basically? Well, I think that the thing is what I teach now, what, you know, all my programs that I have is about trying to get the right technique first and once you've mastered that technique, then being able to put it into game situations and do it at game pace. You've got to have a variety to be able to you know, shoot off the move, um, shoot off the dribble, step backs, creating your own space and everything else. And when I was growing up, people tried to change my shot because they wanted me to shoot more with the ball in front of my face and just shoot way up. I'm like, but I can't shoot it on somebody. If I shoot like that, I'm going to get blocked. Mm. So I developed it. Everything was still exactly the same, even though it was unique. Mm. My elbow was straight, my wrist was cocked, the ball came out of the right part of my hand, mm. but I developed it that I could shoot it against someone because then I just pulled it from further back if I was going to get blocked but I felt like I could shoot it over people and I had to be able to do that. Um, So it was definitely unique um, but the fundamentals of uh, what I still teach today, you know, exactly the same. Yeah, 100%. We'll move into your career now because you started as an 18-year-old with the Brisbane Bullets. Um, Yeah. Well, how old are you? 
17, yeah. 17, yeah. So when you made that debut, how would that come about? What were the circumstances? Do you remember making your debut? Do you remember that game? Yeah. Well, I don't remember specifically, but I was at the Institute of Sport. I'd just, you know, made the Australian junior team, had really good tournaments. Then I had some teams trying to recruit me. And obviously back then college wasn't what it is now, but I mm. um, had one college at Arizona coached by Lute Olsen. He'd come out and spent time with the Australian team and he went hard to try and get me to Arizona. And mm. I just wanted to play for Australia. So I went straight to the NBL. I was in year 11 when I signed. Mm. Um, the Brisbane Bullets had just won a championship in 1987. I, saw, I went on an American tour with them. And then um, after that, they offered me... A contract and I started from my first year as a 17 year old mm. played with unbelievable players which allowed me mm. to be able to do that and I went in believing that I should be playing I think I averaged 15 points a game you know as, as a teenager but I believe that I should have been doing that it mm. wasn't something that I look back on and go oh geez how did you sort of get it, it was like yep okay cool now let's go that's what I'm mm. here for um, and like I said, you sort of develop that confidence because you know you've done the work. Mm. And, you know, 13,000 people we averaged at, at uh, Boondle back in the day, it was, you know, the players were household names. Mm. Uh, it was the Broncos and the Bullets. It was the Bears back then for the AFL, and they were right down the totem pole playing at Carrara, uh, really high profile. And I learned so much playing with guys like Larry Senstock and Ron Radliff, uh, Robert Sibley, and, and these guys was fantastic. Mm. Did you play with Leroy Loggins? Was he still there at the time? Certainly did. Leroy yeah. Loggins, um, yeah, he was a champion. I played five years for the Bullets altogether up mm. and uh, five years with Leroy. Mm. Really was a legend. And, um, you know, what he was able to do for a long period of time was incredible. He was the money man. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic play in the NBL. And well, in the space of four years, um, you named NBL Rookie of the Year in 1988, NBL's Most Improved Player, Good Hands Award in 1990. And as you said, you go on to represent your country at the 1992 Barcelona Olympics after already being cut. But um, yeah, do you look back on that aspect of your career, those few years, and, and just can you, do you look back on a disbelief how quickly that all came about for you? Or is it just a matter of, yeah, I put in the hard work, this is what I've you know, been working towards? You know, was there any surprise that you um, were able to make it to that level so quickly or not? No, like I said, I sort of had the belief that that's where I should be. That's where I belonged and mm. felt like that I could compete against any of those guys and Americans and, and whatever else. Um, you know, after my Bullets year, I shifted to Geelong. The keys to that club and I was coming mm. in. Sorry, <laughs> cut out. That cut out? Yeah, it did. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, I mean, moving to Geelong after my rookie year, Barry Barnes was my coach and mentor and everything else, and I got mm. handed, you know, sort of the keys to that franchise that, you know, they were coming off a season where the club hadn't won a single game. Mm. So Barry was there and he recruited them. I think we won five or six games in the first year, you know, 12 games in the second, and then we finished equal second in the third year. And I was able to grow with that team as a point guard, and I was still developing my game because I played much of the shooting guard in Brisbane and knew I needed to move and develop my skills to, you know, to continue to get better if I was going to start and, and make the Olympic team. And, you know, it worked out really well for me. You mentioned Barry, Barry Barnes there. So I guess I came a bit late in the, the piece in terms of following the sport, I guess, 2000s when I, or 99, 2000s when I was starting to get into the sport myself. And um, obviously saw him coach the Olympics in 2000, but, I remember you put him down as the coach. You put, yeah, I think you selected for an article your favourite or your greatest all-time boomers squad, and uh, he was the coach. What made Barry Barnes such a great coach and mentor for you? Well, you know, I first came across Barry as an eight-year-old, not on Spectres, and he was wow. the grump of head coach <laughs> for the Spectres, and he would overlook the whole program. And I remember him; he just he was grumpy and yell at you and you know, get you going and all the rest of it. But, you know, he grew into a mentor of mine and he was a great support and taught me a lot about basketball. But more than anything else, I trusted him and believed in him. And I knew he had, you know, um, you know everything, you know, good for me um, moving forward, the advice that I would continue to get. So, um, you know, and then playing for him in 1996 and playing for him in 2000, both fourth place finishes. It was as good as anyone at the time until oh. two years ago. 
So um, I think, you know, what he did and, and was fantastic in his own career, but in my career as well. Mm, absolutely. Great coach. And mentioned those uh, two fourth places again, 92 um, in Barcelona and then 96 in Atlanta. And before that Atlanta game, you match up against the USA in that, I guess, that famous game, uh, which you're known for. And it does the rounds every time the Boomers play against the USA, I guess. And that's you taking on Charles Barkley. And, you know, you get asked that question quite a bit. Won't go into that, but what I want to ask you about is that game because I think what gets overlooked is that you absolutely killed it from a shooting point of view. I remember watching on YouTube and, mate, like that was incredible. I think it was eight three-pointers in that game and no wonder he attacked your legs like you couldn't miss. So, um, yeah, what, what, what led to that, I guess, that game? I'm guessing you were amped for it and ready to go. Um, was there an aspect of this might be my chance to, to make an NBA roster and, um, yeah, more of the circumstances that led up to that particular game, that occasion. Uh, I mean, it was funny. I know leading up to that game, my agent was sending stuff to NBA teams, but he was always also sending stuff to European teams. I thought that I was probably going to end up in Europe was the next mm. step for me. But I was having a great season in 1996 for the Kings. Uh, I just shifted there. I was playing under Alan Black. Mm. Uh, I think I was averaging 25, 26 a game, feeling good. And we played... Back then, our season was at the same time as the Olympics. Mm. So you break momentum into that season and um, took that confidence. So playing against them felt no different for me than playing against, you know, the NBL teams. And because I had range, they didn't really know that I could shoot it. So I could shoot it from a bit further out and got on a run and good things were happening and away I went. Mm. It was an incredible game. And I remember you before the game, I think it was you or Andrew Gaze. It, it gives you an insight into the boomers' culture that has been passed down. And um, one of you were interviewed, I can't remember who it was, but um, you said how all the opposing teams were lining up for photos and autographs and you guys were having none of that. You just wanted to you know, go do your best against them. So where does that come from? Does that attitude come from the players in terms of building that culture? Is it the coaches or is it a combination of the two? I think it's a combination. I think it's just the way we are. It's instilled in us as, as Aussies. Barry Barnes was that way. Andrew Gaze, Andrew Vlahoff. That's just what made those guys tick. They wanted to be able to compete. And, you know, we knew at that stage it's unlikely. No one had come close to, you know, the dream teams. Um, and it was unlikely that we would either. But you just want to see, test yourself against the best. And, you know, that was a lead-up game for us to the Olympics. And, you know, we had an unbelievable Olympic campaign and we beat teams that Australia's never ever beaten before mm. with so many NBA players and all mm. the rest of it against all odds we beat some incredible teams and you know I feel like it was the fact that we knew our roles and we built confidence and we believed in each other um, to make that final four and ultimately it was only Sabonis <laughs> that mm. brought us down we had Longley out at the 96 Olympics mm. you know with only down you know one or two points with under a minute to go um, and they had a handful of NBA players. They were superstars and felt like we fought outside our weight class for a long time in that tournament. And um, it, was, it was incredible. Great, great. It was bittersweet because you get so close, but still what a result to finish in the top four with what we had. Mm. Yeah, and I remember Andrew Gay has been interviewed about this recently. And for him, that was probably the toughest of the, the bronze medal matches to, uh, to take, I guess, because you guys were so close. But... You know, Sydney 2000, you know, Longley's out for that one. You, know, you just said you guys were pretty tired at that point. But that one at Atlanta really hurt. But I guess one thing I picked up on him saying was that you can't really, you know, um, put down that achievement, I guess, because, you know, you look around the players around you and they all put in their best efforts. They left no stone unturned to win that bronze medal. So uh, from his point of view, um, it's a su success because of the work you guys put in and, and no one slacked off in the team. Was that your experience as well? Uh, yeah, I never played on a team where anyone slacked off. It mm. just felt like it just wasn't the way we, we went about it. And mm. 90 definitely the best chance. Had we had Longley to be able to play against the bonus, I've got no doubt we medaled. Mm. Um, you know, it was a big out. Luke had an injury. He was in the middle of contract negotiations and everything else. Um, you know, and Mark Bradkey, you know, just again was incredible for what he was able to do uh, for his size compared to you know the seven footer in in Sabonis but yeah proud proud moments and, and playing against the dream team the second time you know we, we were in exactly the same situation as this current boomers because we played America you know in their country 
mm. in front of 5,000 people at the Atlanta Dome to go into the gold medal game. But yeah. this time, they knew who we were. They had a scouting report. They'd seen the whole tournament and they came up with a game plan to shut us down. And, you know, we were only 10 points down at half time and came closer to that team than any other team um, entire Olympics. So it was just a, it was a great time and to do it in front of such big audiences in America, the home of basketball, mm. uh, was something that you never forget. Absolutely. Um, just going into your comments about Luke Longley and Andrew Gaze, um, obviously that documentary on ABC is again tonight, part two, and uh, Luke's obviously the centrepiece of that and incredible career that he had and obviously Andrew Gaze. But what were those two teammates like to play with and obviously good mates of yours too, particularly Andrew Gaze. How did that relationship come about with Andrew Gaze? I mean, I remember watching this documentary of Andrew Gaze's after the Olympics and um, I remember you saying you filmed most of the footage for that documentary as it's all your home video footage from the Olympics, which is really cool. But yeah, you guys were so different in terms of your personalities and you know, the bleached hair and his going grey, that sort of thing. But um, you struck up such a good friendship. So how did that come about? Um, I first met Drewy even before I was in um, the NBL. I used to go down to Elba Park and just want to play pickup games. I'd get on the train, I'd get down there and just want to be able to play as much as I could. And I remember playing two on two with Drewy. So I don't even know whether you'd remember this, but played two on two and young fella and, you know, opportunity to be able to play against pro players at that age mm. was just unbelievable. Mm. Uh, but yeah, we were so different and I think that's what made it work. Mm. You know, Drewy. You know, he was unathletic, he couldn't really run, he, but, and he's so sort of humble with everything he did, but he was a superstar. And I came in as the sort of brash, you know, young kid, you know, with an attitude and wore the diamond earrings. And diamond <laughs> I was talking shit to everybody and, you know, it was just, we were so different. That's not like you, Shane. <laughs> we, well, we all was, mate, and I always had to, like, yeah. but it worked, you know, and, um, mm. you know, I, I knew that, Drew was the man and I was happy to be able to play that role next to him and, you know, I you know, wanted to be able to get him the ball but I could score at the same time and took pressure off him, uh, mm. took pressure off me and I think the combination, you know, was a really good one and mm. we had success being able to play together. We roomed together for three of my four Olympics. Mm. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of banter. We had a lot of laughs, a lot of yelling coming out of our room. People <laughs> were, were, thought we were like the odd couple. Um, but it was good. It was, you know, great memories and, and happy days. And Luke, you know, I first came across Luke in the under uh, 16s um, playing against Western Australia, him and Andrew Wall. Mm -hmm. And then in the under 18s, they were both a year older than me. And then we all ended up at the Institute together in 1987. So, yeah. and played the Australian junior team together and everything else. So, mm -hmm. you know, great memories of the big fella and those mm -hmm. times and everyone living away from home for the first time. And, uh, trying to find your way in the world and what you're doing and everything else. And again, we we're very different. You know, I'm a six foot one, you know, motivated kid that had to fight for everything that I had that was just, you know, a workhorse. That's, that's what I did. Um, Luke, you know, a seven footer that had come from, you know, Western Australia that wasn't overly enthusiastic or passionate about yeah. the game. We were different, way different. But again, you know, good memories about being able to hang out with him off the court and, and have and, and seeing his career. Obviously, I was really proud of him, what he was able to do in the NBA. And watching the documentary just brings back so many great memories. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it tonight as well. But, um, yeah, the NBA, obviously, you, Andrew Gaze and yourself um, had stints in the NBA. And um, in particular, your first stint was with the Minnesota Timberwolves after the 96 Olympics. Um, can you run us through that and how that came about and what were those experiences like? Um, could, did you have to pinch yourself at times that you're playing in the um, the best competition the world has to offer? Yeah, I mean, well, once the Olympics started and, you know, my form continued on during the Olympics, then, you know, some players want to know what's happening with their agents and other players don't. I wanted to know. Mm. So speaking every day, you know, back in Australia and he's, he's telling me the teams that have got interested so I had like six or seven teams make me offers after the, the Olympics yeah. and only inspired me more than anything else. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, um, I said no to the Lakers, um, went and tried out at Minnesota, had played my best basketball I'd ever played. And it was probably a little bit unfair because I'm playing against Stefan Marbury, you know, their top pick in the draft. He was yeah. a lottery, um, but he was a kid 
and, you know, he was out of season. You know, I'm playing against men coming in from the Olympics and, um, you know, I played unbelievably well and ended up negotiating a three-year deal after that. And, but it was, it was eye-opening the Olympics, you know, I mean the uh, NBA, mm. because it was something I ever dreamed of doing or believed that I would do. So, mm. you know, I'm getting there. But then once I got there, I realised that it could have a really good impact in the NBA. Like we mm. build it up that it's so great, but the intensity is not the same as what it is, particularly for the regular season than what the Olympics is. Mm. Um, but I got frustrated during the year because, you know, I was the third string point guard because Marbury was so young. I was a rookie coming from Australia. They brought in Terry Porter. And they said, mate, you're not really going to play much in your first year. Mm. But then, you know, I had games where you go off and you think, oh, here we go. Now I'm going to play. <laughs> and, you know, after the game where I had five threes in the fourth quarter against Seattle, I was like, yep, here we go. Now I'm going to play. The next game, I think I got 16 seconds and I didn't get on for like five straight games. Wow. So you, go, you get frustrated. It's a long time playing and, um, you know, a lot of games to not be playing. And at the end of that year, they said, all right, now you're ready to be you know, the, the point guard, you're going to be the backup point guard to Steph. You're going to be ready to play 15 to 20 minutes a game. Mm -hmm. So it was exciting for me to do that. I went to Summer League, led the league in Summer League in assists. Um, was playing great basketball. Stefan Marbury was out for the first five games of um, the exhibition season for my second year. So I started all five games and was averaging double figures. And then the last game before the season, I tore my calf and I was mm -hmm. going to be out for 15 weeks. And, you know, it's, I don't have too many regrets in my career, but this is one of them. I mm. said, no, nah, that's it. I, I, I'm, I want to go home. And they're like, no, 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 you've got a three-year deal. You're going to 16 weeks. You'll get back. We'll be right and everything else. But it's difficult when you're over there because I had two kids under two. We were living in minus 30 degrees. And, you know, I, I look back now and go, you sook. You want to just pick it out. <laughs> like... They don't care. You've got a three-year deal. They give you the time. They, they don't rush injuries and stuff. Mm. I was just so impatient, so impatient. I just wanted it to happen, so frustrated and um, probably didn't handle it the right way and came home. Mm. Well, mate, but uh, you got another crack at it with the Spurs in 2003. And I remember this season, you going over. We'll go back to the Kings in the moment because you won the championship and then you announced your retirement. But this uh, came out of nowhere, I guess, for, from your point of view. But, um, again, it goes to show the cutthroat nature of the NBA because you, you had about three months there with the Spurs, but um, a great opportunity to be coached by Greg Popovich and play with guys like Tim Duncan, Manad Ginobili and uh, Tony Parker. What was that experience like, first of all? But, um, yeah, how did that uh, work out that you got the opportunity to go over there? Yeah, I mean, it was that was a completely different mindset and opportunity to Spurs. Um, you know, I'd already retired. I was just planning on playing part-time basketball, take some great contracts, going to Europe for, you know, half the season when teams were desperate. I didn't want to play 12 months of the year. I'd sort of burned out a little bit. You know, I'd played for so long. Mm. And, um, you know, I was, on the holiday, I was on the holidays at the Gold Coast with my family and got the call to say, would I come to camp? And that they thought I was a great chance to be able to make it. Um, so I quickly started training, started organising sessions to drive to Brisbane to get back into it, trying to get into shape because I only had four weeks. Uh, went there. Um, the environment was incredible. The opportunity to play under Popovich, um, to spend time with some of those superstars is something that I'll never forget. Um, had a really big game in the exhibition game. I was about to get cut in before the, ex um, before the season started. And then I had a massive game. I think I had 16 points in... 15 or 16 minutes off the bench and then they signed me and um, but I wasn't hungry I was, it was so different than playing at Minnesota mm. where I knew that I could go to another level I knew that I belonged mm. I, I didn't really care the same you know whether I was there or not because I just wasn't in that mindset that's why I'd retired in the first place mm. and I so, made I was more lucky to be there for for three months at the end of the day I could have Quite easily, if I didn't have that game, I would have been there for bloody a month. That not even not even that. Mm. So um, you know, and then eventually Pop came to me. He goes, "Mate, you know you're done. If you want to hang around for ten days, uh, we're messing with our roster. We'll have a spot for you in ten days. Um, we'll put you up at the hotel." And I wasn't that hungry. I had an offer from Greece mm. for more money the next day, and I'm like, "Mate, I'm done. I'm going to pick up my family. I'm going back to Greece." And 
it didn't excite me being at the end of the bench and not playing. If I was going sure. mm. to play basketball, I wanted to play. Yeah. It, it's funny how some people, like I was with Sean Marks, and Sean Marks had been there for years, and he was on injured reserve. He wasn't even in the travelling squad. But he was just happy to be there and be part of the NBA. And it's just different personalities, what you, you accept, what you want to do, what sort of competitive desires you've got. And it was just, yeah, so when I, I got cut, um, moved straight on, went back to Greece, had a season there, played the Olympics and retired again. Mm. More yeah. than Johnny Farnham. <laughs> That's right. I was going to come to that because there was a few retirements. But jumping back to the Kings, though, because... You did win a championship with them, and I've no doubt that's one of the highlights of your career because of the nature of it. Just prior to that uh, that season, I remember you guys were nicknamed the, the Violet Crumbles because you got so close and couldn't get across that um, hurdle, which is probably nicknamed that hurt. But um, you had many cracks at it with the Kings in the season prior. Then the team goes into administration from memory, and um, you know you pick up the pieces. I think you step in and help out a little bit with that uh, from memory, and then with ownership, but then um, they bring in Brian Gorgian and um, Kings fans are probably like, oh, here we go, this would be good. And it turned out to be an incredible season. I mean, I remember I was playing for Southern Sharks at the time. You guys were training and I was watching on and I was thinking to myself, because I was a Razorback fan at the time, we got no chance. Like, they've been in administration, you know, um, didn't even know the imports you brought in, Kavossi Franklin, Chris Williams, how wrong I was. <laughs> so a 15, 15 year old looking at this team, but it was an incredible team that you guys had and ended up winning the, the championship that year. Um, just going to the preseason, did you feel like there was something different about this team than prior years? And um, was it a surprise that you won the championship? Or um, how, and how good was it to get the monkey off the back, if you will, to win the, eventually win the championship that year? Well, I, I think it goes back further than that. When I came back from Europe, uh, we came to the 2000 Olympics and mm. I had to make probably the biggest decision of my life because I got offered a great deal from the Melbourne Tigers. And because yeah. I was with the Melbourne Tigers uh, for the whole time I was in Europe and America and everything else, I had a house in Melbourne. I'd go and train with the Tigers and Lindsay was great. I knew all the guys, had a lot of fun, uh, enjoyed their system and everything else. Mm. So when I came back from Europe, played the Olympics, had exactly the same money. My, one of my best mates is a general manager of the Melbourne Tigers, and he was my agent. So he was having a deal with himself from the Melbourne Tigers and exactly the same deal from the Sydney Kings. And I had so many sleepless nights of which way I was going to go. And ultimately, I had, I had to make the hardest decision of my life, and that was to say no to the Melbourne Tigers because I would have felt like I was virtually just buying my first championship, going to a loaded team like they do in the NBA right now. Mm. And I, now, the Kings have never won it. They were the Violet Crumbles, mm-hmm. exactly like you said. Um, but I wanted to captain the Sydney Kings to the first ever championship. Mm-hmm. And it was a hard route. And there was years after I made that decision, the first two years, but what have I done? This team, we are shit. And then we go into administration. There is no... <laughs> so then I'm sitting there with Grant Caddy and looking for imports. And he goes, mate... Um, what are we going to do coaching-wise? Like, and he hadn't had a great history with, with um, Brian Gorgian. And I hadn't had a great history with Gorge. You know, he was hard-nosed, passionate about his team there and all the rest of it. And you, you compete. We're like, he's the best man. So Grant jumped on a plane, went down there, recruited him. Gorge says, you know, how's Shane with this? He said, yep, he's in. Came up. And from that moment, like, we just clicked. And I just knew... Um, he didn't know Kavossi Franklin and, and Chris Williams because we brought him out in the off-season. They played some practice games. They were both fantastic, really good fits, good guys. Um, and from the very start, I said, I remember saying to Gorge at the start of the season, I said, mate, we can win this. Wow. And he was all taken back like, oh, mate, we're not like ready for that. He plays everything down so much. Like the last thing he wanted to do was hear that we could win it. He was like playing it down to make the finals almost. But... Um, it was a special team. It was mm. so well balanced. And, um, you know, we had belief and, and finally we were able to bring that championship. And it meant so much to me because I was an owner. I owned, you know, 10% of the, the club um, as we won it. And uh, it was something special. And rather than take off and go back to Europe for the, for the Bucks, I was, you know, um, you know, invested in being able to stay and try and help the Kings win it. Mm. So when you look back on your career, the 
fact that you played for so many NBL teams, are the Sydney Kings, like if you were to say that's my team, is the Sydney Kings that team or is it not yeah. really? Yeah. Well, when you say I played for so many teams, I mean, I, I, I went to Brisbane, it's my rookie year, I went to play for Barry Barnes for mm. three years. I, I felt like I was going to stay in Geelong for my career. And then mm. after the three years, they sacked um, Barry Barnes. So I went back to Brisbane. So, you know, I went, had another four or five years there and, and, um, uh, and then ended up at Sydney. So really that's sort of where it was at. And then um, after a few retirements, came back out of retirement to go to South Dragons. So. Yeah. Fair enough then. Um, you mentioned the 2000 Olympics. It would be a miss of me not to mention it because it was such a great time for the, the country and no doubt for yourself too to play at an Olympic Games in your home country and um, I've had Jason Smith on the podcast, Chris Anstey um, just recently and each of them said what an incredible opportunity it was and um, the opportunity to represent your nation on home soil but just the sheer sense of patriotism that was around the place at the time as well and I remember we actually didn't watch the uh, uh, the Tokyo Games, uh, the opening ceremony. My wife and I watched the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games and seen a baby face Shane Hill walk out with Andrew Gaze waving the flag. It just just brought back memories of such a great time. So um, despite not winning the bronze medal, um, again, no doubt one of the highlights of your career as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, we, we travelled so much. It was my third Olympics. You're doing it sort of on your own um, or with your team but without your family. So to have my family in the stands was something that was very, very special and mm. friends. Um, you're right. I mean, the Australians were just so patriotic at that time and it was just an incredible Olympics and, uh, you know, I was asked to be part of them. Very fortunate that, you know, it was the right timing. You know, you mm. obviously can't pick those things and, mm. you know, to get to an Australian Olympic was something that was special. Yeah, absolutely. And your last Olympics is 2004 um, at Athens. And again, you mentioned the retirement. Uh, you come back here, you play for the Spurs, you go to Greece, and then you have the opportunity to, I guess, be asked whether you wanted to play. Was that your initiative or this, the Gorge asked you to play? Or Yeah, no, that was, that was Gorge. He, yeah. um, well, Gorge wasn't the coach. I retired after the 2000 Olympics when mm. Phil Smith took over. I said, mm. no, nah, this isn't for me. And, and that group that he picked went and lost to New Zealand for the first time yeah. ever. So yeah, I remember that. To Olympics, um, Phil was out of there. Gorge took the job. We just won a championship together, and you know he called me straight away and said, "Mate, I need. Can you come and captain this team for me?" Mm. And um, it was always going to be tough because mm. you know the caliber of players was obviously going to be very different than what I'd left playing in two thousand and mm. the talent that we had in two thousand and all the rest of it. So it was really a transition period. A nineteen-year-old Andrew Bogut. Mm. Um, that I was asked to mentor at different mm. stages, and um, you know, it was, it was it was great being able to do that with Gorge, and it was great to be able to play my fourth Olympics, mm. uh, and I was appreciative to be able to captain our country. Mm. Absolutely, it was such a, as you said, a transition period because there was no Brad Kidd, there's no Gaze, no Longley, as you said. There's still a few of a handful of the players from 2000, Catalini, Brett Ma, Jason Smith was still in the team at that point, but. As you said, 19-year-old Andrew Bogut, um, so many new players were coming into that, that squad. Um, but I remember one game in particular when you came up against the USA again in the Olympics and you had Alan Iverson in that team, Tim Duncan, your former teammate. It was a loaded team, a young LeBron James, uh, Dwayne Wade. Like, it was incredible, that team. Um, but you almost won it. And I remember watching this game thinking, we're going to do it. Like, it wasn't until the last quarter, really, when they took off, similar to the other night. But... Um, when you look back on that Olympics, um, there were so many players that came through, like Matt Nielsen, that would go on to have a long career, and Andrew Bogut. Um, did you get a sense that Australian basketball was in okay hands at that point? Um, well, I've never doubted that Australian basketball is in good hands with the amount of talent that we've got coming through. You always knew Bogut was going to be a superstar. Um, but it was a mixed sort of bag, that that team, because... Mm. A lot of the guys that came in, because the older guys retired, there's so many old guys that retired after the 2000 Olympics, it was almost like they missed an opportunity to blood young guys, which is always a worry. So some of the guys that came in were guys like Glenn Savile that weren't, weren't that young anymore. They had sort of mm. played a long time. CJ Bruton had never played for Australia mm. before. So they, were really? sort of, they weren't at the end mm. of their careers. Mm. 
but they weren't young either. So it was a bit of a transition period, you know, waiting for that next lot of guys to be able to come through yeah. as well. The Joe Ingalls and those guys were the guys that sort of came next. Mm, absolutely. We had that retirement after that uh, Olympics. I remember you getting shared off after the Olympic Games there and you come back out of retirement again. It's like Michael Jordan, the amount of retirements, as you said, Johnny Farnham. But yeah. um, come back to, well, you end up pretty much after a few games becoming player coach of the new franchise, South Dragons. I remember being pulled out of the Kings crowd one day to um, uh, be the ball, uh, what do you call it, the, the water boy for your team. I don't know how that happened. I think it was Gary Speckman or something, the, the chaplain who I know. But I remember you were the team that I was doing the waterfall and I was just looking at you like, how are you doing that? How are you captaining or playing and then coaching? Like, no one's done it before. What was that experience like being player coach of an NBL franchise? Yeah, tough. Well, yeah. again, I, I didn't even plan on playing. Mm. You know, Gold Coast, I was in retirement, I was enjoying myself, getting some sun, enjoying time with the family and, you know, got a call from the South Dragons to say, hey, would you come out of retirement and help start our franchise? And then um, the thing that motivated me to do it was it sort of word got out that they were talking to me and then the common theme was, oh, you can't come out of retirement at 36 and actually be able to perform. And then I was like, really? <laughs> okay, Sounds man. accepted. Yeah, now let's start talking, mm. so, um, especially after a couple of years off. Um, so I took the challenge and, yeah, I mean, it was a difficult time because, you know, I was going to play under an NBA legend in Mark Price. It was one of the things that mm. convinced me to sort of get it done, a point guard of, you know, his sort of calibre, but became very um, evident to everybody involved after we lost the first six games that, yeah, Mark wasn't a coach and he certainly... Um, wasn't there putting the time in and um, that you would expect from a head coach. And so then uh, the owner pulled me aside and said, mate, we're going to move Mark Price on. Do you want to take over for the rest of the season as a player coach? And he, I was like, what? <laughs> like, and, and then I said, what are the other options? Like, what are you going to do? Like, if I say no, who else are you going to get? And he's like, well, we don't, like started rattling off some names that might be available. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to play for them. And that was part of the motivation is that there wasn't great coaches six games into a season that you would actually want to play for. Mm. So I ended up, you know, taking the challenge and, um, you know, we turned things around and we ended up becoming the first ever franchise, um, new franchise to make the playoffs. Mm. Mm. A real running uh, streak. I said I needed to be able to change an import. Um, they allowed me to do that. Uh, brought in uh, Roselle Alice. He was just mm. tough undersized and tough and you know we had a crew that played well together we got on together went on a run and ended up making the playoffs so you know it was, it was good but the second year was difficult because they had a small budget couldn't recruit we were really young had some injuries and then the second year was really tough and um you know it's something again you look back on and you gain a lot of experience from those things because i wasn't planning on coaching and i didn't have any coaching experience like normally you're going to go do a two-year apprenticeship or something mm -hmm. under a good coach before you take the reins it's not like hey we, you want to coach we we uh we, we need you to take the reins you know tomorrow run mm. the drills and you know get your offense and recruit an import and away you go wow. so it was it was a big challenge but um yeah just more experience yeah absolutely i remember guy malloy was there from um, memory he was your assistant coach at the time so there was no thoughts about putting him in him in the in the role i guess yeah there was that's why i took it Okay, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, fair cool. We'll move on. <laughs> but um, after that, you moved to the Gold Coast Blaze, another new franchise, and um, uh, finished your career there. I remember um, going to watch you train. Mark Hawkins was assistant coach, had a connection with him, so went up there and, and watched you guys train. And um, it's a shame that the Blaze folded because it looked like a great opportunity and um, could have kicked on. But just the question before I move into your coaching career, which we'll come to, um, We've seen so many uh, franchises come and go over the years. And you're at, you started in the height of the 90s when the NBL was booming um, in terms of the popularity. Um, then you went to that 2000s period where it was probably at its worst. I remember 2009, I think the Sydney Spirit had like a few hundred people at their game. Like it was the lowest of lows then. And now we see it booming once again. So I guess my question, um, how do we not repeat that failure of, um, yeah, 
that, that two, middle 2000s period where we've just had teams come and go and fall over. We've seen Jack Jumpers coming in now, um, the Melbourne Phoenix. Do you think we've got the model now that can see us have long-term success from an NBL standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think it's different now. I mean, you're right, 2009 to probably five, six years ago was probably at its all-time low since the you know, 70s and 80s, really. Mm. Uh, but what Larry's done is he's been able to put it back on the map again mm. and the growth he's been able to put in year after year. And, you know, he, he's, he's, you know, brought an expertise with his management um, people in there at the head office, but he's also brought a big bank balance to be able to invest in that, was we've never seen before. I mean, it used to be mm. run by yeah. So we've gone from that of having no money to, you know, somebody that's cashed up and is prepared to, you know, put money into it, and but also inject um, expertise and a desire to be able to take it to another level. And, you know, the professionalism is off the charts and you now recognised internationally and, and all the rest of it. These, these licences are worth real money now. They're bringing in people... Um, that can afford to take some losses, um, which, you know, they could never do that before. A lot of the times, you know, when I coached the Sydney Kings, mm. there was 15 different owners, yeah. you know. Everyone wanted to coach the team. Yeah. You know, we have that now. You know, mm. we've got an owner in each team virtually that, um, you know, are prepared to make the decisions and, you know, it's, it's gone a long way, um, you know, since those days. Mm. I guess you can see the... the st- now, where it's at now when you're attracting players back like Andrew Bogut, now Matthew Delavadova, well, they want to come back and play. Like, What does that say about the league and, and, and their desire to come back and you know, put into Australian basketball at the end of their well, career? And you're right, but I think probably the bigger thing is that you're getting the LaMelo balls. Mm-hmm. You know, we get people come from America to use Australia to get back to America. Mm. Um, that's the thing that we've never seen before. The, the older guys were always going to come back at the end of the career and be part of it and finish their career, and I think that'll continue to happen. But mm. the exciting thing for me is just we're getting these next stars and we're getting Americans that haven't been able to make it in their own country mm. come to Australia, get some profile, improve their game, and go back to the NBA. Yeah. I mean, we have so many examples of that now, um, and we're getting a reputation for it. We're a country that really good players want to be able to come and play to make the next level. It's just unbelievable. And if you had told me that 10 years ago, I said, there's no way, mate, that's going to happen. Mm, absolutely. That's incredible to see. And you mentioned the Sydney Kings there. Yeah, it's a stint coaching them um, and made the playoffs with a pretty poor budget, it must be said, um, when you came in. That was a jersey behind me. is probably the remnants of that, that squad back there. Um, but... Uh, Going on to um, coaching now, you're now with the Sydney Uni Flames and congratulations again uh, with that, that appointment. But um, just in terms of coaching, I spoke to Chris Anstey about this and you've been under so many great coaches before, you Greg Popovich's, Gorgians. Um, something I asked him about when he was coaching Melbourne Tigers, um, obviously you want to take on board some of those, you know, the good things that these coaches have, the great attributes. But you don't want to do that at the expense of finding your own identity and your own self as a coach. So how is that? How, how difficult is that to juggle in terms of um, bringing in these ideas that you've been under before, but also still finding your own identity as a um, professional basketball coach? Well, I think what you do as a player is you're lucky enough to, you know, sort of be doing an apprenticeship every single day. You're learning from other players that you're playing with. You're learning from coaches, all the scouting reports, the video sessions and everything else. And you develop your own philosophies as a player hmm. from, having so many different coaches and playing on national teams and what it's like to play in Europe, which is totally different mm. than playing in the NBA or playing in the NBL. So you continue to evolve your philosophies about what you think is successful and then you sort of morph that into where you think um, how the game should be played and what you're trying to mm. recruit and the style uh, and everything else. Um, so... You know, I think that's what it's all about and you just need to get in the right situations. And again, like for me, for the Sydney Kings, you know, I came in and took over, I think they only won it three or four games and I took over for the last six games of the season and depleted list and we won 50% of our games and then I signed a two-year deal and um, the team was last and we went from last to make the playoffs. And then the following year, they dropped their budget again. And But you, you sort of make decisions. I didn't. I decided not to continue with the Kings because I didn't want to deal with 15 owners. Mm-hmm. I didn't want people telling me what, how I should sub. 
or what I should think. People who have never played the game mm. or played a local comp yeah. and think because they put money in, they can dictate what your mindset is and how you should coach. And I've got more pride than that. So at the, the second last game, I announced at the press conference without anyone knowing, said, I'm done. I'm not putting my hat in the ring again for next year. And we just lost the game that stopped us from going into the playoffs. Had we mm. won game we would have been it would have only been us and Perth that made the playoffs for the two years running so I went to New Zealand and coached in New Zealand and won a championship there and you know again you continue to develop philosophies but you know I've always been somebody that will only coach if the circumstances are right I'd never get back into coaching a team unless I felt like I was on the same page and I never want to feel like I did coaching the Kings again. Absolutely do you see yourself coming back into the NBL at some point is that still an aspiration? No, not really. It never was, though. Sure. It was like when I came in, I, you know, I got a call, you know, from the King's board because, you know, Ian Revered, um, they'd moved on, had six games to go. They needed somebody to coach the rest of the year. I wasn't planning on becoming an NBL coach. Oh. But I went down there and we were able to turn things around and, you know, fill that hole and um, say, no, I don't have any aspirations of, of coaching in the NBL. I'm really excited about this challenge and we'll just wait and see what happens after the three years you know it's a big challenge to take over a team i've gone for a really young team because uh, i've signed a three-year contract i haven't felt like we've got to go spend a big budget and, and sign big recruits and try and you know bring everybody in to win it the first year it's about setting a culture and attracting the right people that play hard and want to be coached and we're the youngest team in the league and the the smallest team in the league and I know that wherever we finish this year and whatever we do whilst we'll be aiming for a championship we know that next year will be even better we're going to try and build something that has sustained um, success which would be great mm. all the best for it mate it's going to be exciting to see you back on the sidelines but it's, uh, a couple more questions as we finish up and uh, just if I can get philosophical with you for a moment you mentioned the word success there and it's something I've been on the journey of over the last probably couple of weeks um, this idea of rediscovering success because I read this quote recently that really resonated with me that success isn't about what you can get or what you can accumulate. It's what you can give. And um, as I've been become a father and, and, um, and grown up in life, I guess um, it's not about playing in grand finals or um, you know, success that you can accumulate. It's about passing on knowledge and I guess your life to other people, including my kids. And I guess from your point of view and your career standpoint, um, with so much success on the surface um, level, I guess. Does that kind of quote resonate with you as you've moved into coaching now? You're now in the part of your life where you're passing on your knowledge and, and uh, your understanding of the sport of basketball, passing it on and, and very much being there for your daughter who's um, doing great things in the sport of basketball as well. And if you look at what Paddy Mills said in terms of the boomers' culture and that being passed down as well, for me that's success when you can... Uh, mentor when you can pass on something and then see someone else succeed not just making it about yourself so does that sort of um, idea or definition of success resonate with you particularly as you move again into that coaching dynamic yeah I mean when you're a parent and when you're a coach it's all about mentoring mm. you're trying to you know help people get better but you know you've still got to set goals you're still trying to win you're still you know trying to blend those things together it's important to be able to set those goals and trying to be the best you can and helping each individual be the best they can and help their skills their mindset and mentor those people and trying to bring them together and understand what a team looks like and sacrifice and you know being happy for each other you know are all traits of um you know what good teams look like with good culture and you yeah. you generally the, the longer you get into it, I think the more opportunity you get to attract people that want that, are looking for hardworking sort of environments, but really supportive and mentoring environments where everyone's after the same thing. Um, you know, it's it, and it's tough to be able to build and tough to be able to recruit and everything else. But, you know, I think we can do it. And, you know, I'm happy to be coached by my daughter. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm all three of my daughters and great relationship and, you know, obviously um, enjoyed seeing her continue to get success and mentoring her through the ups and downs. And, you know, you have so many downs as well. Hmm. And how you actually do that and, and work with them and motivate them and support them and, 
and encourage them, but then still keep them accountable and understand what it takes to get to the next level. And it's just such a fine line of balancing all of those things. But at the end of the day, your players have to know that you've got their best interests in heart. Hmm. You know, as a coach, you still have to make hard decisions and, you know, you have to be the person that gives a flick on the nose as well as a cuddle and, and encouragement and everything else. So uh, it's a real balancing act. You know, I like coaching the girls after parenting three girls. I feel hmm. like I know girls and how they are and, and, and act. And, um, you know, I look forward to this this next challenge and I'm excited. You know, the hoop's capital, mate. That's what's happening. Yeah. He's developing this with the Sydney Kings. It's exciting hmm. what they're been able to do and to be honest if Paul wasn't involved I wouldn't have got back in coaching in a WNBL team yeah. I wasn't coaching if it was a uni flames mm. um, this is a direction they want to go that's really important into their overall business strategy mm. um, be able to develop this women's program in a much bigger sort of scale and I'm really excited about it mm. that's exciting stuff as you said Look forward to seeing you on sidelines, mate. A few quick five questions to finish. Uh, the reason we call this podcast uh, the More Than Game podcast is because, from my point of view, um, there's life lessons that we we um, learn um, from the sport of basketball, professional sport, um, and especially if you're self-playing at a high level. What's one of the uh, the life lessons you've learned from playing the sport at a high level that you've been applied to your life? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> Ah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, the, the amount of lessons that, you know, and what you think as a teenager compared to what you think when you're 50 mm. years of age, life lessons, life lessons are huge. But, you know, the, you, you've got to be passionate about what you do. If you don't have that passion, it's very difficult to be, to be great at anything, to be honest. So it all starts with passion for me. Yeah, that's good. Um, out of everything you've achieved, what's your greatest achievement? Hold on, mate. You froze up. All right. <coughs> yeah, sorry, you froze. Go again. Great, greatest achievement. My greatest achievement? Yeah, how do you think you've achieved? Um, I think, you know, being able to have a great family. You know, I've been married 27 years and I've got mm. three unbelievable kids mm. that all live at home, 26, 25 and 19, <laughs> that are all happy and we're all very together. Mm. Yeah something that is very difficult to be able to do and I take a great amount of pride mm. that um, I've got those sort of relationships. So mm. probably being that sort of dad is probably the man. Yeah. Good answer, mate. Uh, final two, um, toughest player that you've played against. So I guess the player that you have, when you looked at the other opposition uh, roster who you sort of didn't want to come up against or hated coming up against. Oh... Mm. You know, I, I always say, like, in the NBL, it was, it was Jason Smith. Because mm. the Gorgian coach teams were incredible as it was. But you throw a tough six-foot-four guard that was relentless and more athletic and stronger than you, you're trying <laughs> to get shots off against him. Um, it was always a tough matchup, yeah. And I got my number more than I got his number. Mm -hmm. um, but then in the NBA, I mean, every matchup was huge. Mm. And in the Olympics, the same, you know, you're coming against just superstar guards that Australians didn't even know who they were, mm. but they were just world class players. Yeah, that's it. All right, final question, mate. Will the Sydney Flames win the 2021 2022 WNBL title? Well, that's the goal. <laughs> the league, I would imagine, would be aiming for that championship, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting. It's going to be tough. There's so much talent. The, the mm. WNBA players that are coming to the WNBL this year is off the charts. Mm. I've got two rookie Americans and uh, we'll be young, we'll be enthusiastic, we'll be tough, we'll be athletic uh, and we'll have a crack. Mm. So um, we'll wait and see how that goes. Awesome, mate. Well, we'll see how we go. But uh, we'll finish on that note. Thanks, Shane, for joining us today on the More Than A Game podcast and sharing your story. Thanks, mate. Too easy. Thanks for having me, mate. Well done. Yeah, cheers, brother.